Yanko Wango. Let's go. Yanko Wango. Let's go. Watch. I want to play it smart. Yanko Wango. Let's go. A brand new start. Yanko Wango. Let's go. Watch. I want to fly. Yanko Wango. Let's go. Give great a try. Live your best life every day with a smart network. Hutch, go smart. I want to play it smart. Yanko Wango, let's go. A brand new start. Yanko Wango, let's go. Hutch, I want to fly. Yanko Wango, let's go. Give great a try. Live your best life every day with a smart network. Hutch, go smart. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Welcome to the webinar on discussion. Good morning. Welcome to the discussion on set. I would like to thank our sponsors, Hutchison Telecommunication Lanka Private Limited and London Stock Exchange Group Sri Lanka. Without further ado, I would inform everyone of the house rules. Kindly switch off your cameras and mute your mics. Only the speakers will use their audio and video for their presentations and dialogue. Questions from the participants will be taken only through the chat box. A recording of this meeting will be shared after the conclusion of the session. I now welcome Tanushi Dishanayaka to take over and commence the session. Tanushi. Thank you very much, Nisan Sala. A very good morning to everyone who is joining with us today. I would like to warmly welcome all of you to this webinar on the overview of the proposed data protection bill and its application organized by the Chamber Academy, the knowledge arm of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce in partnership with the Information and Communication Technology Agency of Sri Lanka. Um, so I will be your moderator for day today. I'm Thanushi Desanayaka, an attorney at law by profession. I'm uh, working in the capacity of uh, legal officer at ICTA. And uh, I will be navigating this discussion with the panel of esteemed speakers to give you an overall understanding of what the data protection bill encompasses. And as corporate stakeholders, what you should know regarding your role when dealing with personal data belonging to your customers and clients once the proposed data protection bill becomes a law. So why is this personal data protection so important to us? Why is the need to have this uh, discussion among ourselves? Today, when a person's data is fallen into the wrong hands, it can cause more damage than good, which can affect the person's right to privacy and also it can endanger the very existence of that person. There are so many ways and means where a person's data will be gathered through many different ways where almost all our actions can be traced and the individuals are mostly at risk, especially when they deal with corporate entities on their day-to-day -day operations. So once these individuals surrender their personal data to corporates to obtain goods and services, it becomes the responsibility of the corporates to ensure that their customers' data are well protected 
and are not vulnerable to any unauthorized use or person. So in light of this, I would like to give um, a little background to the personal data protection legislation, which was drafted by the Data Protection Drafting Committee and Legal Draftsman Department in order to define these specific measures that should be taken by corporate entities, such as banks, telecommunication partners, uh, hospitals, and other personal data aggregating and processing entities to protect the personal data belonging to individuals held by them. So today in our panel, we are very fortunate to have three members from the Data Protection Drafting Committee, including the chairman of the Data Protection Committee, who I'm very fortunate uh, to be working with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I would like to take this opportunity to introduce you all to our panel of esteemed speakers who will be sharing their knowledge today and their experience on the subject of data protection. Uh, let me first introduce Mr. Jayanth Fernando. Uh, he is the current General Counsel of uh, Information and Technology Agency of Sri Lanka. I, uh, Jayanth, Mr. Jayanth is a founder director of Sri Lanka CERT and served as its chairman. He was also former commissioner of Securities and Exchange Commission and presently the chairman of LK Domain Name Registry and a director of the Columbus Stock Exchange. He is an attorney at law by profession with a specialized master's degree in law in telecommunications and IT law. From year 1997 onwards, he pioneered drafting of several information and communication technology related legislation, giving leadership to Sri Lanka's accession the Budapest Electronic Communications Convention in 2016. He also chairs, like I mentioned, Sri Lanka's Data Protection Law Drafting Committee and the Committee for Cybersecurity Bill. He also serves as an advisor to the Attorney General and Minister of Finance. And in recognition of 20 years of service in digital policies and laws, Mr. Fernando was also presented with the Lifetime Achievement Award at the National 01 Digital Awards in 2017. Moving on, the next speaker will be Ms. Sandhana Vikramasinghe. She is an attorney at law by profession and has obtained her LLB from Faculty of Law, University of Colombo, and a Bachelor of Science in Information Technology from Middlesex University, UK. Sandhuni also possesses an advanced Master of Laws degree in Law and Digital Technologies from Leiden University, Netherlands. She is a member of the International Association of Privacy Professionals and is a Certified Information Privacy Manager and a Certified Information Privacy Professional of Europe. Sandhuri began her career at the Attorney General's Department and subsequently served as Assistant Manager Legal at Mobitel Private Limited. Uh, she also serves as a member of the Personal Data Protection Law Drafting Committee and currently works as an independent consultant for digital laws. Uh, Shenuka is a, uh, the next speaker we have is uh, Shenuka Jala. Shenuka is a manager of uh, Group Regulatory Division and also the manager of Data Privacy Office at Dialog PLC. She is an attorney at law by profession and a certified information privacy manager. She obtained her LLB degree from University of London and thereafter successfully read for LLM that is a master's in law from University of West London. She is also a member in the Personal Data Protection Law Drafting Committee, which was responsible for drafting Sri Lanka's first ever personal data protection law. She is a regular speaker on a variety of subjects relating to data protection. Then we have with us Mr. Jehan Peripanayagam. Mr. Jehan Peripanayagam serves as uh, the Chief Executive Officer of Informate Private Limited. He is an experienced BPM industry professional with over 25 years industry experience, and he pioneered the concept of rural BPM in Sri Lanka. He serves as the vice chairman of uh, SLASCOM and ACCA Sri Lanka. He will be joining us today to share his experience with the data protection legislation and its practical aspect on it. Last but not least, we have Ms. Chiranthi Balapatapandi. Uh, who is also a part of ICTA, who has over eight years of work experience of trade development and investment promotion. 
Her extensive exposure and vast knowledge of acquire, was acquired during her tenure at the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, British and Canadian High Commissions, and being an inaugural team member at CHAC Port City since its commencement. She holds a master's in international relations from University of Colombo and a master's in business administration from University of Wales and a postgraduate diploma in marketing from Chartered Institute of Industry Sri Lanka. I would like to warm in the audience for joining with us today for this session. So without further ado, I would like to move on to our panel discussion. And I would like to open the floor by inviting Mr. Jayanta Fernando to share with the audience the objective of bringing in the data protection bill and a brief, brief history on how it came about. Uh, if you want, if you have any questions that you would like to ask us, we will be taking the questions at the end of the discussion once all the speakers have um, spoken. And uh, uh, you may raise your hand and uh, you can uh, at that point when we uh, give the command you can uh, switch on your mic and raise the questions at that point so over to you mr fernando um, yeah uh, thank you very much tanushi for the excellent uh, overview uh, and uh, in the first instance i would like to thank the uh, Ceylon chamber uh, for partnering icta uh, to conduct uh, an awareness session of this nature at a very important uh, time when uh, the uh, draft data protection legislation uh, is moving from a draft uh, piece of legislation into a, uh, a, a bill that will be uh, gasseted consequent to uh, approval of the cabinet of ministers and thereafter uh, sooner than later be presented to parliament uh, due to the fact that just a few weeks ago uh, the honorable attorney general uh, gave the constitutional approval uh, to the bill after nearly a little over 14 15 months of substantial review for constitutional compliance of the bill. Uh, so uh, in order to give an overview, I thought I'll make it very brief in about uh, seven, eight minutes. Uh, we, I think many of you uh, who are members of the Ceylon Chamber uh, in the audience are familiar as to why uh, this piece of legislation is important. Uh, we all know that in the era of digitization uh, with uh, everything uh, being done online now virtually uh, in the context of COVID, uh, the ramp up of digital adoption happened even in in Sri Lanka, it became imperative that data sets of individuals collected by banks, by telcos, by hospitals, uh, by government agencies, uh, and those who are engaged in uh, data uh, aggregating as well as processing should have very clear guidelines as to how uh, this individual data would be uh, protected. So, and also the citizens on the other hand, there has been a demand uh, for the last decade and a half uh, citizens not only in Sri Lanka but globally uh, there has been a demand to ensure their own protection when their data profiles, profiles are collect, collected by individuals uh, organizations and multinationals as well so uh, what happened was a few years back uh, the, the subject became of uh, significant importance in terms of uh, legislative prioritization and uh, the ministry responsible for subject together with ICTA, uh, together with the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, partnering with Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Media together with all key stakeholders 
had multiple dialogues and it became incumbent that, uh, and it became common knowledge that the lack of uh, data protection legislation in Sri Lanka was going to be a investment barrier and potential uh, non-tariff uh, uh, entry barrier for Sri Lanka's businesses in number of jurisdictions globally and for those investors in foreign countries to come and uh, uh, locate themselves in Sri Lanka, effectively invest in Sri Lanka. So this, uh, in, this concern uh, th that the lack of legislation uh, created uh, convinced the policymakers to fast track the formulation of the legislation. So it is in that context, uh, a mandate was given to the data protection uh, bill drafting committee to formulate this piece of legislation meeting certain international minimum standards. So let me tell you what were the international standards that the drafting committee looked at. We looked at the OECD privacy guidelines that sets perhaps the foundation for even the European community directives to take shape over a 10, 20 year period. We looked at these OECD privacy guidelines, the APAC privacy framework, which is also founded on the OECD privacy guidelines. We looked at the Council of Europe Data Protection Convention, uh, Convention 108, which is perhaps the only international treaty on the subject of data protection available at present, where even non-European countries like Russia, Russia is part of Europe, no doubt, uh, Senegal, Mauritius, you now even Ghana, Ghana, make their countries a destination for investors from those jurisdictions to have the comfort that uh, those countries are following the same standard. So then we also looked at the European Union data protection uh, regulation, uh, the GDPR, as well as laws enacted by several countries globally, UK, Singapore, Australia, Mauritius, including the draft bill formulated by India, in recent times, which is in the form of a draft bill. And what was adopted by the state of California, which is even interestingly quite uh, more stringent than even the, the, the EU GDPR standard. So having looked at all these standards, we have evolved into a uh, time frame where, uh, where, where the, the legislative formulation happened through, through a process of consultation. The drafting committee, as quite rightly pointed out by Tanushi, included representatives from government, central bank, Ministry of justice, but we also had representations from the private sector. So Sadhuri Vikramasinghe, Shenuka Jayalat, and others is a reflection of the public sector, private sector, inclusive process that went into the drafting of this bill. Uh, the bill went through seven rounds of stakeholder consultations. And thereafter, we went through a number of sectoral uh, engagements with the uh, uh, Junior Bar Committee of the Bar Association, which had a, a fantastic session last year on the 20th of February, just before COVID hit us. Uh, we had over 230 participants, including from the judges of the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, giving their observations on the bill. And then we had uh, engagements with Central Bank, Bankers Association, Right to Information Commission that is administered in the Right to Information Bill. And then we also had uh, 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 the Legislative Committee of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, making a fantastic effort sitting together, giving several rounds of observations at the various st stages of the drafting of the bill. We all also engage 
the Telecom Regulatory Commission and many other entities like that. And it was after all these sectoral consultations and dialogues that the bill reached this level of uh, maturity. And uh, thereafter, as I mentioned, the uh, Attorney General's Department, the Constitutional Branch, looked at the implementation side of the bill in terms of co constitutional compliance. Uh, uh, and after several rounds of review, version changes done over 14 months by the legal draftsman's department. In fact, I want to commend the huge effort taken by the Honorable Chief Legal Draftsman of Sri Lanka together with her team, who made a valiant effort to work collaboratively with the drafting committee uh, and our stakeholders to understand the various nuances of the bill, do so many and changes measures, and then upon uh, it being approved by the cabinet of ministers it will be uh, uh, gasseted as a bill uh, and open for further public scrutiny thereafter presented to parliament and i want to thank the ceylon chamber of commerce also uh, in, especially their uh, legislative affairs committee for the substantial inputs they gave from time to time and it is up to you all as stakeholders to look at it from the point of adoption and see uh, how much of time you need for, to adopt this legislation, guide the policymakers in that process and support the establishment of uh, the, the, the data protection authority uh, that will uh, give the implementation uh, direction and the teeth uh, for this law to be effectively utilized amongst our stakeholder. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, this bill is a very important piece of legislation in the era of digitization, especially in the context of the digital economy. It will enhance Sri Lanka's potential to start up new ventures, attract new investments, and will create new vistas of opportunities in terms of job creation, which I think Ceylon Chamber uh, members would be more interested in uh, knowing. And perhaps uh, you can uh, create more awareness within your companies and we will support you in that process going forward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to emphasize is that this bill and intends to balance the interest of the companies and enterprises who rely on personal data uh, and their processing and the interest of the individual whose personal data is being processed so that there will be transparency, accountability in the processing activities carried out by all of uh, the large corporates uh, which are members uh, gathered here today. So that is the high level overview which I think uh, I would give for the moment and I will pass on the floor to Tanushi so that my colleagues could go into uh, further details of the specific provisions of the bill. Thank you, Tanushi. Thank you, Mr. Fernando, for giving us that uh, very detailed but interesting overview of the background which led to the current data protection bill, which is uh, now almost in the process of becoming an act and a law very soon. So. Um, in light of the data protection bill, I would like to uh, invite Sanduni Vikramasinghe to give us a little overview on the key players who are um, most uh, important under this data protection bill. Uh, there are uh, terms, terminology and definitions such as data control controller district and uh, there are other persons and uh, individuals who will be uh, affected by this legislation and to whom does this law apply. So uh, Sanduni, over to you to give us a little brief uh, this, uh, overview as to what the key play, who the key players are. Over to you, Sanduni. Thank you, Tanushi. And uh, thank you, Sivan Chamber, for organizing such a uh, timely event uh, as uh, 
I think the beta is on the verge of being gazetted once the uh, translations are completed. So in that context, so as you mentioned, um, the bill introduces, it's the first of its kind in Sri Lanka, to be, uh, uh, explain to you uh, at the outset. So there are several key players which the law recognizes as a data controller, processor, and data subject. So if I start with data subject, so uh, this is uh, a natural person, a human being, who is already identified or who can be identified with reference to uh, certain unique identifiers such as their NIC number, their address, name, and so on, or any other uh, physiological, psychological, uh, social, or cultural identity specific to that individual. So it could be the, yeah, their photograph, it could be their biometric data, it could be uh, information relating to their um, uh, you know, social associations and so on. So uh, the data subject essentially has uh, is a human being, not a company or any other legal entity. And uh, any information that uh, I, relates to such identified or identifiable data subject would amount to personal data. A, co a control, on the other hand, is uh, could be a, a human being or a legal person, like a company, or uh, the government uh, in its capacity as a ministry, a department, a public authority, uh, and so on who uh, decides on the intentions and purposes of processing personal data. So that is to say he decides which information to collect and why uh, that information needs to be collected or processed uh, and the way to process certain information and whether to employ third parties in this processing activity. So he's the person who basically calls the shots and uh, most of the obligations, pretty much 90% of the obligations of this bill are cast on the control and the controller remains ultimately liable or responsible or answerable to the data subject because as far as the data subject is concerned it's only the data controller uh, he or she would have interaction with and uh, so most of these obligations are geared towards uh, making sure the controller remains accountable in his processing activities and uh, the other uh, stakeholder that is identified here is the data processor who uh, is the Sony instructor employee of the controller, but a third party who is uh, contracted by the controller. So, this is to say, uh, uh, outsourcing entity. Uh, uh, you know, for example, a cloud uh, service provider or someone who carries out a certain agency work for you. So this could be a complete third party the controller who essentially acts on the instructions of the controller. And uh, there is certain uh, obligations casted on this controller person relationship as well, where uh, the processor cannot act on its own volition. So at the moment, the processor decides to uh, deviate from any instruction given by the controller, then such processor is uh, uh, immediately deemed as a control. So uh, that's basically the gist of uh, all these three uh, key players. And with regards to a question about to whom this law applies, so there is a certain extraterritorial application to this law. So it not only, that is to say, it not only applies to controllers or processors located in Sri Lanka or any uh, uh, mission abroad, but uh, any person who's outside of Sri Lanka, who lo located outside of Sri Lanka, but process uh, personal data of persons who are in Sri Lanka, insofar as offering goods and services to them, or profiles their behaviors, uh, insofar as that uh, behavior takes place within Sri Lanka, or, mo uh, or monitors uh, their, their behavior as well. So uh, even if you are a control located in Sri Lanka, and you might argue that you're not processing information relating to Sri Lankans, but this law, uh, that this law would, uh, would not apply to you, but that's, uh, that's not correct. Uh, even if you are processing data that uh, relates to uh, individuals who are located outside of Sri Lanka, the fact that as a controller, you are located here in Sri Lanka, this law would trigger and you would be required to comply with the provisions as well. Okay, 
Thank you very much, Sanduni, for your uh, very clear uh, description and definition of the key players who are uh, monumental in the data protection bill. Uh, now that uh, when we are going forward in this discussion and for all the other um, discussions and webinars that will be coming in the future, we will be using these terminology such as data controller, data subject and data processor. and uh, uh, once the uh, definitions have been identified, you will be able to uh, grasp the uh, gist of it and you will now understand who are the key players and we will be using this terminology from going forward. So I think uh, thank you very much, uh, Santuni, for that very clear definition. So uh, moving on, uh, I would like to uh, turn to uh, Chiranti Bala Patapendi, uh, my colleague from ICTA. Uh, on her perspective as to how it this affects the economy and industries in general, like the effect the data protection bill has on the economy and uh, the industries, uh, speaking from your experience. Over to you, Chiranti. Thank you, Tanishi, and thank you, Chamber, for uh, organizing this event. Uh, before I get into the uh, effect uh, of the data protection bill, on the economy and the industries, I'm just going to give you a short briefing on actually what the Information Communication Technology Agency does, uh, which uh, where all of us work at. Uh, so the ICTA or the Information Communication Technology Agency of Sri Lanka is the apex ICT institution mandated to implement the government's policies and action plans in relation to ICT. Uh, the overall vision is making Sri Lanka a digitally inclusive country. Uh, we have three main pillars, uh, that's digital government, digital economy, digital services, and of course, digital laws and policies running across all three pillars. So the digital economy strategy is actually looking at utilizing existing programs and all relevant partners of the ecosystem to develop and implement an integrated digital economic transformation, uh, which would lead to higher operational efficiency, lower costs, and better services and outcomes for its citizens. Uh, the industrial, sorry, industry development vertical, which I directly work with, uh, looks at the industry, the stakeholders, and of course the ecosystem. Uh, we all know that uh, the the world keeps changing, continuously changing, and one of its fundamental drivers is digital transformation, uh, and. Uh, Digital transformation is using, it's all about actually using the latest technology to do better. And right now with the pandemic, we are looking at an increasingly data-driven economy. Uh, going through to your question, um, Ankh had mentions that data brings in opportunities in the form of knowledge, innovation, and profits if it's analyzed effectively and transformed into intelligence. So why is data important? It enhances competitiveness and the expansion of companies across sectors. It also helps in decision-making, production, transactions, and relationship management. Uh, for an industry, why should uh, data protection, what are the advantages or how would it affect industries? It safeguards valuable information. It makes you stay ahead of competition. I mean, uh, by protecting information of your clients, it will increase investor confidence. And also, I think we all know that we have a lot of hackers, so it makes it difficult for hackers to access sensitive information if this data protection is available in a country. 
uh, you can uh, deter criminals from uh, kind of identity thefts, phishing scams, and other types of fraudulent activities. Um, it co complying with the regulations is will also bring you to a good industry standing. And uh, if you take, uh, it also is a better management and storage of information, which can lead to better practices. So data protection basically, I believe is process of securing data and important information from being compromised or corrupted as I think uh, Tanushi initially explained. And although it may be a challenge, it enables businesses to boost their return on investment, uh, improve customer loyalty and more efficient operations. Uh, there are many benefits in, in complying with the data protection law, as well as it being a law, uh, good data protection also makes good economic sense and it saves you time and money. It also shows people that you care about their information, which is good for your reputation and your brand. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your input on the subject, Chiranti, especially from the point of view of um, uh, your role as the Director of Industry Development at ICTA. Uh, it was very valuable that you spoke about the um, economical and uh, industrial effect the Data Protection Bill has uh, from your point of view as part of ICTA. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so before I move on uh, to the next uh, speaker, I would like to remind you again that uh, you can raise your questions at the Q&A box, as well as uh, once the uh, discussion is over, once the speakers have addressed uh, with their uh, speeches, then uh, we will give you, we will open the floor to you to raise your questions and uh, you can raise your hand and uh, then we will let you in to unmute your mic so that you can uh, ask those questions and um, have a discussion with the speakers. So uh, with that uh, overview from uh, Chiranti on the effect on the economy and the industries in general, I suppose you have uh, uh, so far gotten an understanding as to how and why the corporates need to understand the application of the data protection bill. So on that note, I would like to move on to our next speaker, uh, Shenuka Jayalat from uh, Dialogue PLC to speak about uh, what the companies should be doing in order to prepare themselves for these upcoming data protection laws and regulations. Because uh, like uh, Mr. Jayanta Fernando explained earlier, the data protection law is almost there. So we, are, we have a very limited time to prepare ourselves as corporate entities to face the uh, challenges and to uh, implement these laws and regulations into our companies. So let me um, hand over the floor to uh, Shenuka to uh, uh, let you know what the companies should do to prepare themselves for the upcoming data protection laws and regulations. Over to you, Shenuka. Thanks, Tanushi. Um, so this is a great question, I think, because uh, as soon as you see a law like this uh, being published, I and mean, when you hear about it in the news that it's going to come in and be, become applicable in Sri Lanka, the first instinct of a company processing data or any company would be to panic. So I think the first step to preparing yourself is not to panic because and not to see privacy as a burden per se, because it, it's why it seems like there's a lot of things that you need to do. It, there, there's another side to that coin. You, it can enhance the value of your business and build shareholder value. And also from a consumer angle, privacy is a great selling point. If you, if you pitch yourself as a privacy compliant organization, uh, your consumers are also more likely to trust you and uh, more likely to be drawn to you. So uh, also the concept of privacy is not entirely new. It's... Uh, a lot of industries have inbuilt privacy and confidentiality obligations imposed by statute or under license. For example, I come from the telco industry, so I'm using a telco example. Uh, 
telcos have privacy and confidentiality obligations flowing from their licenses. Uh, then if you look at the banking or finance business industry, there are secrecy requirements that those laws impose on them. So it's not a very, it's not, it's not a fresh concept per se, but if you look at the law, the law is taking it one step further and, and telling you, okay, these are additional things you need to do. You need, now it, it's expanding on the already established base. So while you need not panic, you also need to be prepared and you need to remember that there are penalties from flowing from the law for non-compliance. So you look at Europe and the GDPR, uh, recently they've fined Amazon 888 million US dollars under the GDPR. So there are, and that's just one of the fines that they've imposed. So even under our law, there are uh, certain penalties for non-compliance like for example, uh, you, they can impose penalties, the authority can impose penalties up to 10 million for non-compliance. And if you don't rectify it, there's a possibility of a double penalty. And there, there are provisions where the authority can even suspend your business or cancel your license. So it's important that as a company, you are well prepared to take on that challenge and that you, you know what you're doing. So uh, that I have a few points that I want to highlight. Uh, the certain things that you need to be aware of. One thing is it's absolutely essential that you recruit people who have the correct skill and knowledge uh, in data protection and who can advise you on the nuances of the law and tell you, okay, this is how you need to, how you need to focus and what you need to do. Uh, also important is you need to have your top management buy-in and they need to see the importance of privacy and the tone has to be set at the top. It needs to be like a dashboard item, if you would say, so that uh, everyone in the organization is, it's, it flows right down from the top. Uh, then you need to also make sure that you train all your staff and impo most importantly, those special, special focus to staff who access personal data and handle personal data. Then you need to go a step further and also train your pro data processors. For example, you may have outsourced a certain task to some third party company who becomes a data processor by virtue of handling your personal, the personal data of your customers. So you need to also focus on training them and making them aware that this law is there, there are certain penalties, there are repercussions, and these are the things you need to do. So this is quite similar, I think, to the exercise a couple of years back, uh, companies did this on confidential information. So they put in new practices, they train their staff. So this is also a similar journey that you need to take. Uh, then under the act, you have to uh, set, set out a data protection management program. So uh, that would be a privacy program that the organization puts in place saying, this is how we handle our personal data. So uh, a few tips on that privacy management program would be you need to do this, do a couple of things which which will ensure that you, you are on the right track. So you need to assess what, where you are as a company. So to see, uh, okay, the, what is the data that I currently have? Uh, how, what is my maturity level in terms of privacy? Do I have in processors set in place? Have my processors been documented? What are the systems I'm using? Then you need to identify your data life cycle, see whether you need, whether you're processing special categories of personal data, whether you need to do data protection impact assessments, you need to carry out some data inventories. These are all very high level. And I mean, it, I'm just giving you a very broad picture of it, but this is this is the general direction that you should take. Then uh, you need to set in place a very strong, that's your basis, that's the bedrock, your, uh, like a governance mechanism of strong policy framework, which will steer the organization through your privacy journey. Uh, then you need to, now once you assess and find out what you have, what your you as an organization, where you are, you need to put in place practices that will safeguard your uh, personal data. So you have to put in strong infosec practices. You need to inbuilt privacy by design. That is to ensure that your products are also crafted with privacy, keeping privacy in mind. So it's inbuilt into your product and you don't need to come back later and find out, okay, I haven't done this. I need to now figure out how I can comply with the law and bring in privacy angles. So at the design stage, if you in incorporate these privacy aspects, 
you, your your transition will be smoother and your compliance also will be smoother. Then uh, you need to also conduct risk assessments and after that set in place a monitoring mechanism, a very strong monitoring mechanism so that you can uh, have continuous monitoring of whether you are on track. So internal and external audit. And again, I, I really want to stress on the importance of training because you can have uh, great policies, you can have a great information security safeguards, but if you don't have, if your staff doesn't know what they're supposed to be doing, that is where the leak will come. And that's where you can be fined and where you will have a breach. So, also, so while you do that, you need to also ensure that you have, in case you do have a breach, you need to have breach management plans, incident response plans, and also ways of addressing certain law enforcement requests. Thank you very much, Shanuka, for that uh, detailed overview as to what the companies should keep in mind when the data protection bill comes into place. I think uh, it gave a really um, clear overview as to the company's role and uh, what you should prepare yourselves for and uh, any changes and uh, uh, restructuring that you need to do within the company itself in preparation for the upcoming data protection bill. So uh, we'll move on to the next speaker that we have, Mr. Jehan Peripanayagam. Uh, Jehan, I would like to ask you um, a few questions on um, your experience as an industry personnel. What Were, were there any uh, in, uh, situations where you had to uh, deal with a customer who were demanding these data protection regulations, which were applicable in some other jurisdiction, since we do not have the data protection law currently in place. From your experience in dealing with the customers, foreign customers, uh, how do you look at the challenges faced by your company uh, when you adhere to these international data protection regulations? And uh, in your perspective, how do you think this will benefit the companies in general? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, appreciate the question and the opportunity. Uh, for my company, Informate Private Limited, which is a BPM, BPM uh, it was a little easier as we had previously obtained ISO 27001 certification, which is the premier standard on information security and confidentiality. So a lot of the measures um, that were spoken of by Shenuka, such as signing non-disclosure agreements, awareness training, internal audits uh, were in place uh, because as a BPM protecting our clients' data is paramount. And this is something that we had uh, foreseen several years ago, and we were one of the first BPMs in the country uh, to get the ISO 27001 certification. So that framework, I highly recommend. It gives a very structured, very methodical approach to approaching this whole area of information security and confidentiality. Uh, but when uh, we had a client uh, coming uh, from Sweden, and they were very keen to work with us, and we were very excited, a huge opportunity, and uh, all the terms were okay. We were at the cusp of signing this agreement uh, when suddenly uh, they realized they had to have the GDPR uh, compliance and there was another additional ag agreement that would be appended or uh, annexed to our main agreement. So when stepping into GDPR, this was new territory because this is overseas jurisdiction uh, and some of the panic uh, that Shenuka spoke of uh, setting. You know, we had come to the very final stages of this negotiation, and especially our leadership and our board from a whole perspective had a lot of questions. What were the liability, uh, personal data? How did Jayanta, uh, at this time, Jayanta, I don't know whether you remember it, uh, but he was so kind as to, to gain a lot of comfort uh, from that, uh, that discussion. And based on that, I did a, a paper to our board. Uh, and some of the points we defined, what is personal data? Well, this was a question uh, at that time. And any personally identifiable data, including phone numbers, it can be linked to a name or a ID. Uh, it is considered personal data. Uh, he briefed us on what is the class action, on what are the liabilities. At that time, there was no class action, which gave us um, 
comfort to proceed? Uh, and what are the roles? And what we realized is the sort of steps that we need to take as a company were very common sense ones. It was not a very, very um, stringent measures, but very common sense things that you know, most companies would normally take. Uh, up, keep your machines, windows up to date as an as a IT company, antivirus, not uh, training your staff not to open unknown attachments, disabling drives so the data can't be taken out. Uh, and keep your client informed if there are any breach or suspected breach. Uh, so we had to look at some additional security measures, including securing data connections, uh, VPNs, and so forth, restricted physical access, additional. Audit. So there was some additional work, uh, but we were, we were broadly ready for it. Uh, in terms of how this would benefit the companies, Uh, overall uh, slash com, which uh, consists of the I to this legislation. An example, four years on, that's a huge contributor to our company and indeed uh, towards the export revenue earnings. Of So compliance willing to enter into this thus, even though they were signing this agreement and required GDPR compliance. Uh, so on the flip side, I've had my colleagues in the software industry who have lost clients because of a lack of a National Data Protection Act. So uh, my colleagues are in, in the industry are very much looking forward to the Data Protection Act as it would increase the rankings and the ratings of Sri Lanka uh, by bodies like Etikani, and it will help us attract new investors, as Jayanta said, and new clients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rehan, for your valuable input on the industry perspective uh, in relation to the data protection bill and uh, sharing us, uh, sharing with us your experience, your practical experience on dealing with customers uh, in relation to the application of the data protection bill. I think uh, that will be a very valuable lesson um, and uh, experience to all the uh, corporate uh, personnel who are listening to us uh, at this webinar to uh, have an understanding and idea as to how you can uh, face these challenges when you're presented with the uh, real life incidents such as uh, uh, what Jehan mentioned earlier. And uh, now usually uh, we have had uh, many uh, uh, sessions and seminars and webinars on uh, this data protection bill and we have gone into details on the legal aspects of it. We have talked about the legal provisions applicable. So the main objective of uh, having this discussion at this point of time when the law is just about to be uh, made is to uh, give you an opportunity and uh, open the floor to the corporate entities to discuss with the data protection uh, drafting committee members and industry personnel to address uh, your concerns and to share with us your uh, the challenges that you all are facing and to give you the opportunity to come up with uh, your issues or whatever the clarifications that you would like to ask from us and to give you uh, a basic understanding and to solve your problems to a certain extent as much as possible. So uh, from this point onwards, we will be taking up uh, the questions from the audience. So um, would you, um, you can also share your questions through the uh, chat window. And uh, also once the uh, questions uh, take, are taken up from the chat windows, uh, if you want to, you can raise your hand uh, through your screen and uh, we will allow you to uh, switch on your mic and uh, ask the question from the panel of um, speakers. Uh, so the, there is one question which has uh, come up. Uh, I will be taking it up at this point. Uh, it is expected to be complied with the GDPR for customers in the Europe. Will there be any contradiction with GDPR and the proposed data protection bill in Sri Lanka? Any key concerns which is to be exercised wisely? Um, I would like to uh, direct this question to Mr. Jayanta Fernando. 
Mr. Fernando, would you like to take this up? Uh, yeah, uh, in the interest of time, shall we ask Sanduni and Shenufa to take uh, those sure. uh, uh, technical questions? Uh, Sanduni? Cool. Sure. So, uh, yeah. Um, thanks, Tanshi and Jantha. So, basically, uh, there are certain deviations from the GDPR. Uh, but if I may speak about the similarities, uh, the principles are this, uh, more or less the same. And uh, additionally, there is this principle of accountability, which we have specifically included within the ambit of uh, data protection principles, where it requires us to establish a data protection management program, which uh, Chenuka briefly touched upon a while ago. Uh, in terms of rights, uh, it's again more or less the same, uh, with the uh, exception of the right to portability, which is not recognized in the Sri Lankan bill. Um, but on the GDPR, you have that obligation to give uh, right to uh, portability. And uh, in terms of, uh, I think one of the most, uh, biggest concerns would be the uh, responsibilities with regards to data breaches. So the uh, law, the bill in its current construction is uh, open, uh, which uh, by allowing the authority to prescribe uh, the uh, breach uh, notification period, so uh, our, I think hopefully it will be in line with the international uh, uh, practices, uh, for example, being uh, incident response being within 72 hours of so, you know, informing the authorities, for example. And um, actually, if you really do do a, a GIP analysis, you realize it's more or less similar. And uh, actually, uh, some of the, the deviations are only taking into account certain nuances within the Sri Lankan legal and uh, economic context. In um, addition to that, uh, the same obligations such as impact assessments, uh, um, appointment of uh, data protection officers, and even cross-border data uh, transfers are uh, largely in line with the practices uh, of the GDPR as well, except where there is a localization requirement for data processed by public authorities, uh, which is strictly limited to public authorities. But then again, there is a certain exemption given where certain classified data uh, uh, with the consultation of the data protection authority and the regulator uh, supervising body of the public authority concern can allow uh, data to be um, processed or stored in a country that is subject to an adequacy decision. So, uh, so the idea was that we uh, draft a law that is largely in line with international standards. So it's not just the GDPR, but also the uh, European Council's uh, 108 Convention and other jurisdictions as well. So if you are GDPR compliant, I think uh, you would be largely compliant with the proposed uh, Sri Lankan bill as well. Uh, if I am to add to that, uh, Tanushi, uh, the only element from a policy perspective, I will add to what uh, Sabine said, uh, something I uh, omitted in my introduction is, uh, and I, this thought came to me when Jehan uh, uh, quite rightly intervened, uh, when all the uh, entities in Sri Lanka, various entities are having various impediments, uh, due to uh, lack of uh, a compliant legislation, we took a policy call uh, to ensure that whatever drafting of a bill we do here is widely consulted, not only amongst our domestic stakeholders, that we reach out to international experts at various stages uh, so that the law that is formulated meets the threshold of internationally compliant standards. Uh, so only point I want to mention is that uh, uh, the, the original framework bill and subsequent revisions that, were, that went through over the years uh, were also discussed uh, with experts internationally, including uh, experts at the European Directorate General for Legal and Consumer Affairs who have now confirmed that our bill has the right checks and balances, A, B, that it meets 
the international standards for cross-border data flow and other relationships building uh, in line with uh, international norms. So that's only point I want to add. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fernando and Sandhuni for uh, providing your feedback on that uh, query. Uh, next, we have a question um, from uh, Joseph. Uh, can ICTA or Chamber or SLASCOM provide or publish a basic to-do essentials list or a template as to how for a company to start, like how to, how to start this process basically? Uh, from the perspective of ICTA, SLASCOM and Chamber of Commerce, I think uh, Almost all the members are present here. So, uh, Mr. Fernando, will we are we in a position to release an essential to-do list? Well, um, can ask our uh, colleagues at, in the digital economy team. Shiranti is here. <laughs> whether that can be an additional stack they can uh, take on to in, as part of their uh, digital economy strategy. Yes, perhaps maybe. But it has to be a partnership arrangement with Slascom and Akul Jehan is here. Uh, I'm sure Jahan uh, playing such a pivotal and leading role in the industry, uh, persuading the various industry uh, stakeholders in the adoption process. Even before we started uh, getting motivated to draft this bill, uh, I'm sure Jahan will play a pivotal role in collaboration. Uh, but I think I would ask Shenuka uh, because of the fact that she uh, gave an uh, interesting perspective from an industry adoption view, uh, her thoughts on how to proceed with an activity of this nature. Shenuka? Uh, thanks, Rath. I, I think uh, one of the things, one of the main functions of the Data Protection Authority, once it is set up, would be to publish guidelines uh, to, of this nature. Because uh, if you look at global examples, uh, for example, Singapore and various other jurisdictions, uh, what the DPA has done once it is established is to uh, put out a lot of advisory guidelines and sectoral guidelines for uh, various organizations and sectors to comply with. And it gives guidance. So, for example, the data protection management program, uh, which is mandated under, uh, under the Act, it says one of the duties of the uh, authority is also to provide advice and guidance on these aspects. So, uh, for example, now Singapore has put out a similar guideline. Now, if you look at, if you go to the Singapore uh, Data Protection Authority website, you can find all these guidelines. In particular, there is a guideline on how you establish a privacy program in a company. So, I think that would uh, that would be more authoritative because then once you comply with that, you are uh, you are in line with the recommendations of the authority. So, you, the, so the authority itself is telling you do this or do the other, and then you're compliant. So whereas an industry body or might be able to give you general guidance, but this would be more authoritative. That's that's what I I feel. I, I also fully concur uh, with the views of uh, Shanuka. Thanks for that intervention. Maybe Sanduni, uh, Shiranti, and Jehan also can uh, bring in their thoughts, uh, Tanushi, on that question. Uh, that actually oh, would uh, lead to uh, another aspect uh, that may need to be addressed about the need to set up the data protection authority uh, in a properly structured manner. Uh, there's a, there are a lot of policy level thoughts going uh, through at this moment. I know Ceylon Chamber has volunteered uh, its support to establish a industry forum and a dialogue to support the establishment of a DPA. Uh, setting up a DPA, a brand new, is a huge challenging task. And uh, this has been one of the biggest uh, concerns, uh, even uh, affecting the work of the drafting committee uh, over the last uh, two years. And the initial thoughts uh, due to the budgetary constraints at the moment was that one of the regulatory bodies like Central Bank, SEC, uh, TRCSL, all of them will come together to set up 
an operational unit which will function like a secretariat initially, and that that would move uh, and be scaled up uh, to the level of a separate independent uh, regulatory authority. Uh, so there are thoughts emanating on that subject, and I would encourage Ceylon Chamber of Commerce um, and its various committees to um, think about uh, how they would uh, effectively work with government stakeholders to uh, uh, ensure that we have a properly structured body, given the importance that uh, Shenuka, Sanduni, and all of the other speakers emphasized uh, uh, just now, a short while ago. So maybe the other uh, speakers also can add their perspective as to how uh, uh, these uh, modular uh, directions, guidelines, et cetera, can be done collaboratively with the leadership of the data protection authority uh, in place in the next maybe one and a half, two years. Thank you. So from my so, perspective, uh, and yeah. well, in fact, when I saw Jonathan's um, question, I had immediately shared an email with my colleagues in Slashcom to see whether this team would be interested to support with. Uh, but I'm sure there will be a series of webinars. I think like hey, there will be many such webinars. Uh, in fact, uh, for the Slashcom members, we are having a session on the 9th. Uh, so we'll also come in. Uh, Jahan, we can't hear you. Jahan? Um, I think he exited. Uh, maybe the yes. connection was bad. Yes, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, Chiranti, would you like to add something to that? Uh, while, yes. Uh, Jahan, yes. Jahan, you're back. Uh, would you like to? No, uh, I, I finished actually. Uh, sorry, oh, sorry okay, about right. that. All right. Okay, Shiranti, your turn. Yeah. So just to add on to what Jehan said, I think uh, once the authority is formed, as uh, mentioned by Jehan rightly, we are not going to stop at this just one webinar. So this will be a continuous dialogue that will uh, take place between the industry and uh, ICTA to SLASCOM to all the uh, you know the the stakeholders of the ecosystem, and we will collaborate and have similar seminars where we can address the issues that may crop up. So for the moment, uh, all the, it's, since it's not enacted, we wait till one, that it, the, the law is enacted and then the authority is formed for us to take it forward. Thank you very much uh, for your input, uh, dear panelists. We will uh, then take up another question. Uh, a very important question has been raised by uh, Viraj. How long will be given for businesses to prepare to fully operationalize this statute, which is necessary in considering the investment that is required for the compliance? Uh, who would like to take up that question out of the lot? Uh, Shenuka, would you mind uh, sharing your views on it? Or anyone else? Sorry, Tanushree, do you mind just, I, I, I lost yeah. you, Tanushree, sorry. Do you mind re uh, rephrasing if you don't? Yeah, it's uh, actually uh, what he's asking is how long will the businesses be given, uh, how, how much of time will the businesses be given to prepare themselves to fully operationalize okay. this statute? Like from the enactment, will there be a grace period and so on? So. I think that's um, what he's trying yeah. to Yeah, so currently the law doesn't uh, doesn't specify a time period. Uh, it says that the law will come into effect on the date the minister uh, by Gazette proclaims the law to come into effect. So uh, if you look at laws like GDPR, there was a grace period. So that is something that we've been discussing. Actually, maybe Sandhani can shed more light on this uh, since we've been discussing this uh, quite a lot. 
Yeah, unfortunately, when we had the framework, we had a three-year uh, timeline where the authority would come into play within uh, 18 months of uh, certification of the speaker of the parliament. And uh, so that will give time for the authority to be set up, then for, uh, the organizational uh, structure and uh, the capacity of the authority to be defined and established. And then they would come up with the guidelines, rules, and regulations, which uh, is empowered by the bill uh, to be uh, promulgated by the CIS authority. And then an additional 18-month period for the, for the uh, controllers and processors to get their affairs in order. But currently, due to a certain policy change, I think Jayantha can shed more light on the policy aspects of this. Um, like Shanuka mentioned, it's been set to uh, come into operation from the date of uh, from the uh, date uh, the minister would uh, describe. And uh, the only uh, extension given is for part four, which is regard to um, uh, the direct marketing provision, uh, provision section, which is section four. So uh, that could get enacted only uh, within, uh, I think, uh, uh, for within a period of 24 to 48 months. Uh, um, and uh, other than that, the rest of the provisions are due to come into operation, which the minister may determine uh, at his discretion. So um, I think it's an I think it's a aspect which the industry should actually uh, lobby for in this uh, in, in the in context. So that taking um, example from other jurisdictions, um, just Europe, but other uh, Asian, uh, Asian and uh, um, uh, APAC region where similar grace periods have been granted because after all this is a law we understand that this is a law that um, covers not just the public sector but also every aspect of the private sector which deals with personal data so enough room must be given a grace period must be given so um, as of now this is how the law stands but hopefully uh, we uh, i think uh, we could see some change uh, uh, in the horizon, but I, I really cannot be, I cannot guarantee uh, change. So if I'm to add to that, uh, Tanushi, um, uh, basically, uh, that's, I think, a very important question. Um, uh, and uh, uh, based on what Shenuka and Sanduni said, uh, the uh, this is perhaps an area that um, Ceylon Chamber, SLASCOM, and other key stakeholders may like to do a flag as part of a uh, 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 important uh, uh, policy uh, item to be taken up in any forum uh, relating to the implementation of this bill. Uh, while we looked at originally uh, a certain amounts of grace periods in the manner uh, Sanduni and Shenuka described, and in the very early stages of the drafting of the bill, uh, uh, those timelines were also uh, 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 factored, basically, or included in our original draft papers based on the premise that the draft bill will be finalized and the constitutional compliances will be completed within about a year and a half. And that was originally the plan. Uh, given the changes in those timelines, I believe, and given the prioritization given to the digital economy frontiers and in view of the new digital strategy adopted um, into 2020, and given the fact that uh, many uh, entities, including government, is rolling out the concept of digital ID, the need for this law to be expedited, uh, came in uh, at the various policy uh, level uh, discussions. Uh, however, uh, I would say that this subject is relatively open. So if you look at section one and the relevant subsections as quite rightly mentioned by Shenuka, the, the, uh, uh, the triggering off period is when the relevant ministry in charge would bring the law into operation. So when the law will come into operation after the legislation is enacted by parliament is a discussion. 
that can be continued, uh, not only from this forum, but as Shiranti said, there'll be several other dialogues. Uh, Jahan also mentioned this uh, from time to time, we can have uh, industry level discussions, awareness sessions, and maybe uh, important take home uh, message I would like to give uh, even Ceylon Chamber is to have a, uh, basically a forum of dialogue where the, uh, the, the time frame implement for the implementation of the bill will be discussed amongst policymakers. So there are various uh, challenges associated with the establishment of a data protection authority. Uh, uh, we can have an option where the data protection authorities uh, uh, or the chapter governing the data protection authorities brought into effect over a period of six months to one year. And thereafter, within uh, X number of months, to bring in the various uh, provisions of the bill into operation. So that subject is, uh, uh, I would say, would remain um, up to the policymakers, of course, for discussion and thereafter for implementation. And all it would take is a committee stage amendment uh, to include that in the bill uh, when it is being discussed in parliament. So that is also possible. Uh, with that said, I think I just saw when I was looking at the chat, Tanushi, there was an interesting question about the uh, intersect between um, uh, the data protection bill, Tanushi, and the right to information uh, provision. And I think I saw uh, a specific question being asked in which sections of the data protection bill uh, can it be directly related to various provisions of especially section five of the right to information act so i think that can be taken and maybe sanduni and shenoka can answer that thank you yes i was actually uh, going to uh, direct that question uh, along with the with a few questions on the uh, Sri Lanka unique digital ID as to how the uh, connection is drawn between the data protection bill and the kind of data that we will be uh, uh, privy to by this uh, digital ID card concept and also uh, drawing uh, parallels between the Right to Information Act and uh, the Data Protection Bill is also a question which has come up. Uh, so Santoni, uh, would you like to take them in like uh, two parts maybe? First, you can um, explain to us since we already had a uh, discussion last Friday with the Department of Register of Persons. I'll be, I think uh, you will be able to shed some light on the applicability of the ID, Sri Lanka Digital ID and the Data Protection Bill, and also uh, to talk a little bit about the Right to Information Act. Um, thanks, uh, Panushi, but I think uh, we could talk for hours on this topic of right to information and data protection as well as how we <laughs> could uh, apply to the Digital ID. But uh, drawing from the discussion that we had with the officials of DRP on Friday, uh, so the, uh, the DRP essentially is a controller within the definition of this law because uh, they are a public authority and uh, they, they are the uh, custodian of uh, one of the very, uh, very personal and very sensitive uh, pieces of information regarding to the citizens. And um, so they are expected to uh, comply with the provisions of this law, which includes uh, complying with the principles of processing, the lawfulness, uh, uh, purpose specification, uh, limitation, uh, purpose, uh, lim uh, specifying purpose and limiting its precision to the purposes, uh, retention requirements, um, being transparent and being accountable, and also ensuring uh, accuracy as well as confidentiality of, of the data that is in their custody. So, uh, just because they are a public authority, they are not exempted from the protections of the DPA, uh, Data Protection Act. Uh, proposed act. And uh, they are also expected to give effect to the rights, uh, which are right to access, uh, um, uh, right to object to processing, and so on, right to rectification. And um, because after all, the DRP has a, a legal mandate, uh, they are 
uh, authorized to collect personal data in the manner give, uh, as set out in the uh, registration, registration of Persons Act. And uh, the digital ID program itself uh, eman uh, also emanates from uh, amendments and regulations that stems from the registration of Persons Act. Uh, and uh, so therefore they have the legal basis to do that. But having said that, it doesn't, uh, the, the DPA once established will have um, overarching powers uh, over the activities to monitor the activities of uh, um, the DRP as well on the instances where it is of the opinion that they are violating the provisions of the, uh, of the data protection law. So uh, rest assured that they are, if uh, a data protection authority with the, with the adequate capacity and uh, uh, expertise is instilled in Sri Lanka, they will have that uh, uh, power to monitor the data processing activities of any public authority, including the DRP. So that's the interplay. So uh, the, the establishment of the DPA does not invalidate uh, the processing mandate uh, given to the DRP under the Registration of Persons Act. But in doing so, the, what the DPA expects is to fill the gaps where the uh, Registration of Persons Act is silent when it comes to uh, processing of personal data. So for example, the definition of consent, um, giving access to information and uh, um, the aspects of joint controllers. Uh, so for example, if the DRP wants to work with the immigration department or some other project uh, where they jointly decide on the intents and purposes. So all of these aspects which the law may not address, the DPA will step in to fill in the gap. And where the, uh, I hope that's sufficiently clear, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll uh, briefly uh, touch upon the interplay between the Right to Information Act. Obviously, the Right to Information Act stems from Article 14A of the Constitution, which grants the fundamental right to information to its citizens. But this is not an absolute right. That is to say, um, it's not something like right to life. Uh, for example, uh, right to information can be limited uh, by the existence of other rights. And so one of that is right to privacy, which Article 14 itself recognizes. And this has been translated to Section 51A exemption of that uh, Right to Information Act, where it recognizes uh, um, the information officer appointed under the RPI can refuse to disclose information if it um, amounts to unwarranted invasion of privacy or uh, unless there is consent from the person concerned or there is an overriding public interest. So uh, if you are processing information uh, um, under the RPI, and uh, the, uh, it will not be illegal under the DPA either, because as long because there are um, in the schedule one and two of the DPA, we recognize uh, doing things in the public interest or pursuant to written laws. So that's the ground where uh, the DPA recognized the existence of uh, information disclosed under the RTA. But having said that, uh, uh, since it's it's um, those are both. Uh, there's a right to the data protection rights recognized by this law as well as right to information uh, are both uh, non-exclusive rights. So we need to uh, evaluate uh, each right on its own merit if there is a, uh, if the two rights are contested. So that is to say, uh, if there is a public interest that has to be established and uh, you need to see what are the safeguards that are guaranteed uh, under the RTI, for example, if a personal data is being disclosed on a uh, uh, public interest ground. So uh, what is important is that the boundaries of public interest uh, what, or what constitute public interest are defined uh, in the RTI as well in order to qualify as a valid ground under the uh, DPA uh, provisions. And uh, in doing so, they can coexist and it's not these laws uh, or rights we don't consider as competing rights, but uh, more so from a, a, a perspective of that they each complement each other because after all, we both recognize the right to access personal information. And uh, so there will also, because there is no blanket answer I can give which from in a given situation. So it will always depend on a case by case basis. 
So uh, I think it will be interesting to see how the law would develop, uh, how our uh, uh, courts will look at in the coexistence of uh, data protection rights as well as right to information. Uh, uh, thank can you. Can I add to much. that? Uh, yeah, yes. can I add to that, Tanusha? Yeah, can I add a few things to that? What uh, somebody said? Uh, is, is it possible? Are we oh, yeah. within time? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, almost. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sanduni and Tanushi, for that uh, 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 very elaborate answer. Uh, I think uh, I saw a question, something to the effect whether. Uh, the data protection bill, uh, whether, whether or not it will undermine RTI. Uh, I just want to address that very clearly to say that uh, the data protection bill was formulated with uh, seven rounds of consultation and uh, maybe a dozen stakeholder uh, sectoral discussions, including with officials nominated by the Right to Information Commission, which submitted a big working paper that was reviewed extensively, not only by the drafting committee, by, but by the legal uh, drafting department. And it was, it must be made a very clear protection bill was to ensure that the right to information and data protection legislation will coexist in a manner so that both rights can be exercised harmoniously. So in that context, I think we should be very clear, and I thought it is my duty to also explain it, uh, that it was never the intention of the data protection bill to undermine RT Act, it was meant to ensure coexistence. And it is in that context that they, uh, uh, we should look at the exemption derogation provision in section 35 of the data protection bill that is founded on certain principles of constitutional law, uh, and case law that has evolved stemming from similar provisions. Uh, and uh, we have had a very strong uh, jurisprudence along uh, those uh, areas of law uh, uh, from uh, uh, multiple Supreme Court cases uh, going back several decades. And finally, uh, there was a question about also whether it can impact investigative journalism, whether, whether whether there could be a, a, a mechanism to investigate. Uh, I just want to assure everybody, uh, this law has quite rightly mentioned by one of the uh, 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 members in the uh, audience in one of the questions is a important bill for generation of income in the country, right? But having said that, we are mindful of the need to ensure various checks and balances in relation to uh, conduct of public authorities, especially in the context of gathering personal data and how they are processed. And it is imperative in conclusion that we should emphasize that this bill is, has nothing to do, uh, it has no criminal measures built in in this law no criminal sanctions built in in the data protection bill. Therefore, there are no criminal investigations built in into this bill. Instead, what we have built in uh, are uh, administrative law measures and the remedies are also administrative law in nature and the data protection authority before they impose penalties, sanctions, et cetera, are required to uh, conduct inquiries. And based on the results of an inquiry, they would issue directives to the entities violating the law to do course corrections. Uh, so only thereafter that penalties and sanctions would come into being. So I think it's imperative that we keep note of the 
a policy framework within which the data protection bill has been formulated and is sought to be implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Fernando and uh, Sanduni for elaborating on that question. So uh, we have a large number of questions pouring in, but unfortunately the time allocated for us has uh, come to an end and uh, has exceeded a little bit as well. So uh, if you have any further queries and uh, if uh, there are any questions that was not answered at this uh, uh, session, you can direct them to the email address given on the chat box, legal at icta.lk, and we will be taking up those questions and we'll provide you an answer. So uh, since we have now uh, come to the end of our session, uh, I, I would like to uh, thank the audience and uh, I hope that this was a fruitful session for all of you and uh, that it helped you to get some knowledge and insight uh, on the data protection bill and uh, that you gathered something new with uh, today's session and uh, it will help you to uh, get a head start on the implementation of the data protection legislation for your companies and to prepare yourself for this uh, when the law comes into place. So uh, I would like to thank uh, the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce who organized this session along with ICTA. Uh, thank you and uh, thank you very much for the panel of esteemed experts who joined with me today to um, present this uh, webinar and uh, who humbly shared their knowledge and expertise with uh, the audience. And uh, thank you so much for the lovely and engaging audience for uh, shooting us with your questions and uh, being engaging uh, and uh, helping us to conduct a very lively session uh, with your questions and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today i would uh, like to hand over the presentation to uh, nisan sala from uh, chamber of commerce uh, so have a pleasant day everyone thank you very much stay safe <laughs>